everyone, I'm Ben. I am the location pastor at the River Church Davison. Uh, thanks so much for checking out one of our messages today. Uh, we'd love to connect with you and your family. One easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word to 97,000. Or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the message today. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here, and if you have a Bible, we'll be in Hebrews chapter number 10. That's where we're going to start, Hebrews chapter 10, that is in the New Testament, uh, toward the end of your Bible, Hebrews chapter 10. We are in our series called Be the Church, and we're talking about what it, what it means to be the team that the church has called us to be. And so the last couple of weeks you've heard, join the team, join the team. You see the whole worship band, they all say shirts on, it said join the team. We're talking about the church And what it's supposed to be, it's a team working together. And uh, last week I had the Pistons jersey, and this week I thought, I could do the Lions, but, you know. So I uh, go to the store and get a Saints jersey, right? Because we're all part of the team. We're Saints, and the Lord got that. We got a Saints. And you're like, you went and bought the jersey for that point? No, no, this was actually, uh, this was uh, part of our camp auction from last year. Somebody bought it. And they've never come and pick it up. So it's been in my office for like a year and a half. So I thought I'd just put it to work today. And uh, so you're getting the Saints jersey. But we are in this study of what it means to be the church. That if you know Christ is your Savior, you're called to be the church. And how God calls for the local body, the, the local church to be, to be a team. Many times I'm asked from new people or even people who have been around a while, they'll ask, Pastor, do we have church membership? Do, how do I become a member? Because some of you have been members in churches other places. And, and, and so there's some, some local churches have membership, which, which isn't a bad thing. It's, it's, um, the Bible doesn't say we should have membership and extra classes, and, but it, it can be used as good. And so, no, we don't have something called membership here. We have to do an extra class or you got to sign a piece of paper that says you'll come this many times a year or give this much money or serve this. We we don't have that. What we believe is if you know Christ is your savior, you're called to be part of the local church. You're called to join the team. And so we want you to to be a part of that. And last week we kicked us off by talking about that, that really that membership. What does it mean? What does it look like to be a part of the team, that local team? And that was in Ephesians chapter 4. So I want to review a little bit with you and and, and let you see those things. Maybe you weren't here last week, but I think it's so important. So Ephesians chapter number 4, verse 12, talks about this. To equip the saints. Saint? Okay. Uh, to, To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. That they're... To be a member that we're called, if we know Christ, we're, we're to be equipped and we're to grow and being more and more equipped to be a part of the team and then, and then to work. But last week when I started with this thought of being equipped, I took you to 1 John and 1 John really gives these steps in growing. And, and I hope you, as a pastor, I hope what you hear on Sunday sticks with you a little bit, right? Like, I, I hope you, you hear it and, and it applies. And, and so last we talked about these, these steps of equipping ourselves. And so the first step of equipping is coming to know Christ as your Savior, to, to, to have your sins forgiving, knowing your trust is in Jesus and to, to make that decision where you've accepted Christ and asked him to forgive you of your sins and to be your Savior. And then that next step of growth of being equipped is you start to overcome sins. The Bible says that you overcome the evil one that through God's word and his truth, you're, you're an overcomer. And then that, that next step is to deeply Know the Father, to grow in that love. So maybe, my hope is that maybe this week you, you prayed that for yourself to say, hey, I know I know my sins are forgiven. God, I need strength to overcome sin. Help me to deeply know you more. Maybe you prayed that for one of your, ch- for your child. I, this week I did, I was praying for Silas. I went, 
This is what I'm going to pray from this week. I went right to this spot of praying that, God, I'm so thankful he, he knows you, and I pray he overcomes sins and knows you deeply. And Maybe you got crazy as a part of this team, and you just prayed it for the church, that you prayed it for our church as, as, as we, this is the church, that you prayed that for your fellow member of the team. I hope we'll do that, to be equipped. And then, and then the Bible says to work, that we're called to good work. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the greatest team, the church. There's no better team. To be a part of the team and serving the Lord, it's the best purpose, the best goal to serve as part of the team. It's exciting. I hope you'll get excited about it. I, uh, a few years ago now, I was the freshman baseball coach at Waterford Kettering, and this is probably seven years ago now, but I was coaching the baseball team. We had a doubleheader, uh, so two games. It was in the second game, and I'll never forget, I... I, I I remember I, I had to do like a pitching change. And when you do a pitching change in freshman baseball, you take him and, okay, you go there and you're going to right field. And then, okay, you can't play that. Okay, we're going to put you in. And so you do a bunch of changes. So I'll never forget, I went to the bench and made those changes. And I looked up at a kid and I said, hey, and I don't remember his name. I remember going, hey, I need you to go out there and play that position. And he looked at me and went, oh, sorry, coach. I already put my flip-flops on. I'm kind of out. This is a sermon against flip-flops, all right? No. I just remember he had checked out. And I was like, what do you mean you got your flip-flop? We're in the middle of the game. We're in the middle. Like, I'm so confused. I would never, young kids these days. Uh, but I think about that with the team we're called to. Are there too many believers they put their flip-flops on? They checked out. Man, we, we have a great work to do. And this team is so important. And so I hope this week has been incredible as we've had the join the team tables and many are signing up or, or with, with student ministry and children ministry and nursery and, and greeting and, and uh, all of those things. I know Pat, our student leader, says, I think he said he had 15 new leaders sign up for student ministry. I was like, this is fantastic. And he was like, I do not want to deal with all these people. No, he was so excited, right? He was so excited that, man, there's more people to be on the team, to use their gifts, to serve the Lord. Maybe we can go reach some more students. It's incredible. It's awesome to be a part of the team. Pat and I were working this week on, on September 30th. I, I want to do a team event. I want to do a local River Church Waterford team event. And here's what it is. It's, it's kind of crazy. See, on September 30th, it's a Friday night. Uh, the closest high school to us is called Waterford Kettering. It's right over there. They usually do not have a very good football team. They're, they usually struggle. And so what I want to do is I want to take the whole team there September 30th. I'm inviting all of you that we go as the River Church and say, hey, Waterford Kettering, the River Church loves you. And we're here and we're going to run concessions and we're going to run the merch table. And then after the game over, we're going to pick up all the trash. And I hope to take, listen, I want to get hundreds of people. I told 8 o'clock they better drink a monster, get ready to go. But I want to take, <laughs> I want to take hundreds of people just to go, hey, there's a church that not is just saying, come here, come here, come here. But there's a church that goes, hey, we're a team and we're coming out there and we're going to love you. This is the team. So I want to continue teaching about this great team that God has called us to. And in Hebrews, at the end of Hebrews, there are these verses that um, I, I so love. I call them the let us verses. They're the verses that say the word let us, not, not food, relax, all right? Don't go to food yet. That's at lunch, but let us. There are the verses that seven times through these verses, the Bible says, let us, not let you or let them. It says, let us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. If you want to turn there, Hebrews, excuse me, Hebrews 10. I told you 10. I was, Hebrews 10, verse 22 says this. Let us 
draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, and with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is saying, let us trust in the Lord. If we've accepted Christ, we have this full assurance of faith. And then verse 23 starts out and says this. What's it say? Let us, thank you all six of you, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This means if we know the Lord, hold on to our hope, that we as this team, let us hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Verse 24 says, and, all right, 22 of you, here we are, we're getting this. By the seventh one, we may be there. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some. Those who have the KJV, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. And many times when we, you hear a sermon on church, they always go to verse 25 that says, don't forsake the assembly of ourselves together, which is so important. But I think you missed the part of let us. This is, a, this is an us thing. And here it's saying, hey, let us hold on to the hope. Let us stir one another up to love and good works. Like the stir stick that many of you have too much creamer in your coffee right now, right? That stir, it stirs it up. And too many times the church is stirring up anger and bitterness with each other. And we're said, hey, as a team, we're called to stir each other up to love and good works. That we don't neglect meeting together. The Bible says, hey, it's not okay to go, yeah, I'll come once in a while. It says, hey, don't neglect. Meet together. Let us. Now, when you study this let us, these words, if you dig deep, you know, if you want to do a really deep study. And, you, and so what I did is I went, well, I wonder what the other translations, how they translate let us. So I went and looked at the KJV and the ESV and the NIV. And you know how they translate it? Let us. <laughs> That's it. Defining let us. It means not alone, not by yourself, not more than one, together. Some of you are like, didn't know. It's a beautiful team that we are called to. And so Hebrews, skip over uh, about a chapter, a page. Hebrews 12 goes on to more let us statements. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness. Let us. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Here it says this. That as we struggle with sin, we're called together. Those things that tangle us up, we're called together to help each other, together to lay those things down, together to support each other. And then it says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This isn't a you're by yourself race. This is a team race. That there are parts where different times, different people are going to struggle. And we're running together as a team. We're called to do this together. So let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And verse 2, I think it just continues about, let us look to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So Hebrews 12, 28. There's a few more. These last three is where I'm going to sit this morning. So those of you who are like, count down, he's got seven lettuce statements. He's already through four. He's got three to go. All right, this is where we're going to set these last three. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And then chapter 13, verse 15 says the, really the same thing. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. The goal this morning is about worshiping together. That we're called to worship the Lord. In awe and reverence, we're called to worship him. 
And so this morning, I want to talk about how do we worship together? What does that look like? If you've been around the church at all, you know there's this great debate when it comes to worship. You know, like, people go, well, I didn't go to that church. Why? I don't like their worship. It's just a funny statement to me. Why didn't you go to the church? I don't like their worship. We, well, I mean, I just, it, their, their worship is loud. Or their worship is so 1997. <laughs> or their worship is so 1897. And we base, like, we, we, we have these, you know, arguments and go, they just, they don't know how to worship. They don't really know how to worship. You know, and this morning in Hebrews, I think the writer of Hebrews shows us how to worship. He points out what real worship is. And, and just a, kind of a spoiler alert, worship isn't just Phil leading us, right? That is a part of worship. And when you study worship throughout the Bible, you'll find that worship is about giving reverence to God. Worship is where we put God, we, this place of awe, this place of devotion, this place where we worship God when we serve him and we work for him and we praise him. So in my office, as I have different kinds of study material and commentaries, one of the things I have is a, um, it's a Greek dictionary of the Bible. So they'll, they'll look up the words, see the New Testament written you know, in Greek, and so they'll, they'll, they'll go to the definition of each of those Greek words. And so I'll look it up and just kind of dig deeper. And so when I go and look up worship, it's, there's not just one Greek word that's used for worship. There are many words in our Bible. They're different Greek words and really translated worship. And so at the end of all the words they use for worship, there's, there's like this little disclaimer of the, the author. He says this. He says, the worship of God is, is nowhere defined in Scripture. It says, uh, a consideration of the above verbs shows that it is not just confined to praise. It's acknowledgement of God and who he is. Worship is what leads our heart and praise and it's thanksgiving and it's action and it's deed and it's acknowledging him. And he's like, so to define worship, it's all of these things. It comes from a true heart. John 4, 23 says, but the hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, this verse that I read to you that speaks of worshiping the Lord. I believe the author and the spirit, he is telling us, listen, I want to show you what real worship looks like. And he does that really by giving us two mountains. I know that sounds crazy. And, and Hebrews, if, if, if you haven't grown up in the church, can be a very difficult book to read. Because what Hebrews is, Hebrews is written really to the Jewish people. Now, it, it, we haven't, it's to us, but it was written to the Jewish people, to those who had come to know Christ and were being persecuted and, and were being the people who said, hey, you can't be a Christian, you must be a Jew. And so they'd be persecuted and so they were struggling. Or there were those Jewish people who knew the Old Testament, they knew those ways, but they were come right up to the edge of accepting Christ. And so you have this book that refers to many of the truths in the Old Testament. Many times, what it does, it's saying, hey, remember this in the Old Testament, the word of God here? Let me show you. It's pointing to Jesus. Remember here, right here, let me show you. It's pointing. And so the book points to Jesus. So if you're a new believer, sometimes that's difficult to understand. And some of you are like, I've been a believer a long time. I struggle through Hebrews. I get it. And this morning, I want to show you this point because the writer says, hey, Many are calling you false worshipers. I want to show you what real worship looks like. So in Hebrews chapter 12, remember that verse in 28, it says, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. I want to show you the passages before that so that you see, I believe this is like the landing point. He's trying to say, hey, I want you to be a true worshiper. And in verse 18, it says this, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words 
made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order, the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now again, the Jewish people reading this know exactly what's going on here. For some of us in here, we read that like fire and lightning. To what, what, I don't, what? Here, I want to show this because I want you to see the writer is saying to worship. There's this illustration of these two mountains that help us to have true worship. So in this passage that I read, 18 through 21, it is speaking of Mount Sinai. Now, if you're a churchy, you know, Mount Sinai, Old Testament, the Bible tells us about this Exodus 19 and 20 on Mount Sinai. This is when we first receive the, the Ten Commandments. This is when we receive the truth, the word of God. And the Israelites know this. And so there was this time where God shows up and the earth shakes and the mountain is smoking and lightning and God speaks and the earth moves and the people are terrified. They're terrified. In Exodus, wait, you don't have to turn there, but in Exodus, in the Old Testament, it says it like this. Now when all the people saw the thunders and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. The people were afraid and trembled and they stood afar off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. I've always wondered why, why didn't they want God speaking to them? And I think it's because when God spoke, the earth started moving. And so, I don't know if any of you have ever been in an earthquake before. That, that start, now, don't tell me, yeah, you know, 94, Michigan earthquake, I felt it. Yeah, Michigan earthquake, anyway, like a real earthquake, right? When the earth shakes, they were so afraid, they're like, Moses, you just translate, you speak to us. When God speaks, it is terrifying. And here, we have God giving, telling us what is holy. And when God showed up, they were terrified. And there was fear. And Exodus tells us what's going on. In Exodus verse 20 now, it says, Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. So I believe the writer right here is showing us, it's taking to a place where, listen, we're not going to have proper worship unless we understand who God is. And so he takes the first mountain and says, hey, remember that mountain that you've taught of, you were taught of? Remember that mountain, how terrifying it is? Well, the point of that mountain, what was the point? One author says it like this, says, this was the purpose of Mount Sinai to bring the people face to face with their own sinfulness, with no place to hide. The law is God's mirror. When we look into it, we see ourselves, and what we really see is the immeasurable, how we're immeasurably short of God's standard of righteousness. There's not a single commandment that we have kept perfectly or can keep perfectly in either act or attitude. Here we have the unapproachable God, and it struck fear in people. What I think is so important is I feel like the church of, the, of this day is getting away from understanding the fear of the Lord. That God is holy, that God is powerful. God is not just a toy to play with, to jump in and jump out. But God, if we know who God is, there is going to be this terror. There is going to be this change in our heart that when we look at God, we have the Ten Commandments to what? It's a reflection to go, man, I'm not holy. I fall short. I I'm not good enough. God, he's holy. God, he's powerful, and to worship him, 
true worship church, we need to have this awe of God that brings us to our knees sometimes. And too many times we're missing, we're missing this mountain. God's holiness. Well, the writer's not done. See, in verse 22, he says another mountain. He says this, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels and festal gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. In verse 24, it says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Here we have another mountain. It points, it says, hey, there's another mountain. It's Mount Zion. And what it is pointing to, what does it do? It takes you to, if you know Christ, if you know Christ, you are a citizen of heaven. If, if you know Christ, the, the Bible says in Philippians 3.20, but as but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is this, when you, when you read it, many of the commentators say there is this present, hey, if you know Jesus as Savior, there is this present, but there's also this waiting, because in here it's describing heaven. It's talking about the angels. It's talking about those who know Christ as their Savior. It talks about the Lord, and it says, Jesus and it explains, really, the mountain of Christ. It explains the new covenant. It says, you know, the old covenant, that mountain, you saw who God is. And God doesn't change, that he's holy and just. He's unapproachable. But I want you to see this new covenant, that Christ, when he came and he was perfect and he died on the cross because of your sin, when he gave his life, now you may approach God, not because of your goodness. You may approach God. He's still terrifying. He's still holy, but you can approach God because of what Christ has done on the cross. See, so if you look back a little bit farther in Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. It's to know the mountain of Christ, to know the grace and the forgiveness. One said, Sinai stands for judgment and death. Zion stands for forgiveness and life. But what I want you to know, you got to keep seeing both mountains. You see that God is loving, but that does not take away from his holiness and how he is just and righteous and how he will judge sin. And here I, the author says, hey, true worship, you have to know who God truly is. That's what true worship, that's what will bring you to a place of reverence. That's what will bring you to a place where you see the approachable God that through God, Jesus, he is approachable. I tried to think of an illustration of what illustrates this. And I just came back to my father. I think of my dad, the way that he worships. Because through my life, seeing my dad and seeing that he knows God and that there was this, there is this humbleness. There is this, when, when, when my dad, and you see it, he just has this time of worship where he's broken because what he does is that mirror of God's holiness reflects back onto him and he goes, man, I am a sinner and it breaks him. And he, and he says, man, I have sinned, but then he doesn't stop at that mountain. 
He sees God's grace and forgiveness, and it just, man, it just pours over him. He goes, man, but I know God's loving forgiveness. I know his care that my sins are, are forgiven. And my dad has taught me how to worship. It's a beautiful thing. Some pitfalls that I see, what happens is, I see some people go, well, God is loving and he's caring. And so what they do is they, they take sin lightly. Worship becomes flippant. Worship becomes irrelevant. It's just, well, I know God forgives, so I'm good. And they walk through life. And the truth is they don't really know who God is. Because if you know God, you can't take sin lightly. Because you know your sin is what took Christ to the cross. You know your sin has judgment. And people will go to places like, but John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm like, yes, keep reading. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Keep reading to the end of John 3. It says this. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. We see who God is. And that, knowing who God is, must take us to a place of worship, of reverence, of awe, of honor knees, repenting of sin. And it also takes us to a place of grace poured over us because of what Jesus did. And church, that's what team worship must look like. So to finish reading the chapter in verse 25, it says, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, right? He's talking back at Mount Sinai. He says if God spoke, but they didn't escape it because they ignored God. He says, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he promised, and yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Here, it is talking about the time Christ coming back. And God is talking about these things that are unshakable. Verse 27, this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of the things that are shakable. But that is things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. One said this, says the things that cannot be shaken will remain. This means the people of God as a part of the order of the things that are unshakable will survive. But everything else in the universe will be shaken and therefore perish. Everything that is wrong will be eradicated. No sin, no imperfection will remain. Then there will be blessed reconstruction. Revelation 21.1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. This points to the coming that God, right, is going to wipe away all the things that are shakable. And he speaks of the universe. He speaks of, uh, have you noticed lately all the pictures of the universe? They keep going, man, that galaxy and that galaxy and that hundred, and, and, and we've gotten pictures of how galaxy, it, the, the heavens, how enormous they are. And I wonder, God, why, did, why so big? It may be because of this, because one day he's going to say, I will speak and they will all shake because of my word. All of it. That is the power of God. But those who know the Lord shall not be shaken. Those who truly know God and his salvation will not be shaken. And church, 
May this take us to verse 28 that says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. As I wrap up, just want to ask you a few questions. As verse 25 says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. Maybe you're in here and you're refusing to listen to God. Maybe it's been for the last couple weeks. Maybe it's been for the last couple years. And you're in a place your heart is hardened and you know God keeps knocking on that hardened heart. I, we as a church are praying that you'll hear his word and know his truth and know his holiness and his grace and forgiveness and accept that gift of Jesus Christ and what he offered to you on the cross. Maybe some of you have been worrying too much about those shakable things. This week has been all about the shakable things that will go away instead of turning and focusing on the things that are unshakable. And lastly, maybe the sermon, as we talk about worship, you found a place of struggle in your life. Maybe you found a place of where there's legalism and you've thought, man, I do enough to get close to God instead of realizing the sin that will take you to a place on your knees and you learn to worship him in fear and trembling. Maybe you're struggling in worship because you can't accept the forgiveness that God has given you. And you're holding on to that in your heart. I think this is an amazing chapter that points out two mountains that we can't afford to miss. The illustration of pointing us to the true, holy, righteous, good, gracious God. And may we be a team that worships him. We stand, please. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for this morning. Lord God, I pray we'll worship you, Lord. Continue to grow us in Jesus' name. Amen.